Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. I am John. On today, we are going to be talking about a recent deal that we actually had to walk away from. And I'm also going to share some of the things that, especially during COVID times, if you're a landlord still purchasing properties, things that you want to look out for. Um, so just a little backstory about this property. It was a rental property with a tenant already in place. Um, my client was actually still going to buy the property uh, with a tenant in place. It was a wholesale deal. We were working with the wholesaler. Everything was fine when it came to price and the assignment fee, all of that. Uh, we were just fine. However, um, it's other parts that, that went into it as far as the tenant and, and their stability that sort of made us have to back out of the deal because with rent moratoriums, steady being kicked down the road, um, we didn't want to possibly take on a bad tenant to where if payment did stop, we wouldn't have any recourse possibly for the next few months. So I'm gonna hop into it. <coughs> I'm literally just gonna share some of the things from the email to where it was a red flag for us. But to start off at, as a landlord, these are going to be four things that you want to make sure that you have whenever you are inheriting a um, whenever you are inheriting a tenant with the property purchase. And that's gonna first and foremost be the current lease. You're going to need a copy of that lease. Um, next is going to be the app. You're gonna need a copy of the lease because uh, as the new owner, you're still obligated to carry out the terms of that lease. So if they aren't giving you the lease, then that may be a deal that you have to pass on. Next is going to be the application. So you want a, a tenant profile. You want to know if this tenant was screened correctly. You want to know um, you want to know their work history, how many hours they're working, are they still in a strong work position. For us, the place where the tenant was working, it was very, very, very unstable and that was his only source of income. And that's gonna lead into one of the things that I'll share that, um, that, that just didn't work out. It was just too unstable. So we have the lease, we have the application so you can have a proper tenant profile. Next is going to be, is there a deposit that's in place? Um, if there is a deposit, then that will transfer at closing. Don't be surprised if a lot of landlords now are saying that they never collected a deposit. And since we are on deposit um, and it came up with our situation, find out if there's a pet in the property. And if so, is there a, um, a pet deposit that's been collected as well? And lastly is going to be the rent rolls. So we've been trying to get 12 months worth of rent rolls, but it's been kind of hard at times. So um, we have even accepted six months worth of rent rolls. How much is the rent? When is it due? What day is it coming in? So we can know if that tenant is paying the rent late or on time. Oftentimes these properties that we're buying, we're buying them from mom and pop landlords who don't have any systems in place. So they may not have kept a nice pretty Excel document or QuickBooks of the rent rolls that's been received. Um, so you may have to request bank statements or else receipts. If you do receipts, um, just do your due diligence on the receipts. Those are very easy to fabricate and just write all out at one time, which is in fact what we think happened with us because all of the receipt book numbers they were all in chronological order so we went back and we requested if we can have a few more receipts prior to the the receipt time frame that they sent us we wanted to see those other few receipts before that so not necessarily the rent receipts but the number that the uh, the number that's already printed on the receipt so those are four things at the very least just for us um, and you as well those are four things that at a minimum you should be uh, receiving from that you should either have your wholesaler get that information for you or else you need to get that information from the seller so i'm going to dive in a little bit about what happened with us and why we had to walk away but i wanted to equip you with that if you know of any others uh, drop them down in the comments if you are a very experienced um cash flow buyer or buy and hold buyer and you have even more things that um that have to be checked off of your box and meet your criteria i'm dying to know drop it in the comments so with us 
Um, this lead came about from a wholesaler. It was on Facebook. We saw it. I like the zip code. Here in St. Louis is very, very, very zip code based. That's probably one of the first things we ask when, whenever a property comes about. Where's it at? Where's it located? Where's the, where's the zip code? Because the zip code can tell me a lot about the neighborhood, about the property, um, before I even go out and view it. So, um, <clears throat> some things that came back with us, it was from a wholesaler. He, he sent the deal over to us. We went out to view the property because we first had to do our physical due diligence, check it out, um, which everything was pretty cool. For the most part, it was, uh, it was some plumbing issues, some cosmetic issues, um, the, the roof over the deck that, that needed to be replaced. So we were fine with all of that structurally. Um, we, we did go back and let him know that, hey, this is a little bit more repairs than what you mentioned. However, we were fine with the building <clears throat> and taking on the responsibility for that. We just had to make sure that we had a strong tenant in place. Um, so some of the things that came up with us is some discrepancies that we sent back to them were first, the lease states the payment was made by cashier's check or money order, but the receipts show that it was paid by cash. So we sent that back to him for he to, for him to send that to the seller. And what she told us was that she no longer has the PO box and that she collects the, the rent from the tenant in cash. Okay, all right, she, she won that one. Um, we, moving forward, we definitely, we will want to have it established that we aren't going to be accepting cash, ex especially since the new owner was going to be out of state. <coughs> so we wanted to make sure that this tenant was able to uh, either do some form of electronic payment or else send a money order or cashier's check to a, um, to a P.O. box. So next is, it's in the lease it says that there was a $300 security deposit. However, $0 is highlighted. Please explain. And again, this seller told us that no security deposit was collected. And her answer was, yes, the tenant does not have a security deposit for this lease agreement August 2020 through August 2021. They did previously in 2018. So that's understandable. It's not, and because there was a gap in, um, in this tenant standing in this property. He lived there before he left and then came back. She actually invited him back. Um, so that's understandable. It probably was a lot of copy and paste from the initial lease that they had in place where he did have a deposit. Um, and then she probably just ended up using that same lease and, and didn't cross out some of the verbiage from that previous lease. Next is going to be no pet deposit of $200 was collected from the tenant and no monthly payment was established. And her answer was the tenant should not have a pet in the property <laughs> um, because her uh, homeowner's insurance does not allow for that, especially a pit bull. So um, we, we did let her know that, hey, there's a pit bull in the property. The first time we went, we actually didn't even go in because we could hear him like about to tear the garage door down. Um, but luckily he, he wasn't a really big pit bull. He was just one of those short, stocky ones. Um, so there should not be a, tenant, a, a pit bull in the property and or the tenant would need to have his own liability insurance for a pet. No pet deposit was collected. So what's going on there is, first the tenant is in breach of the contract or in breach of their lease because he has a pet and not just a little small dog, but he has a pit bull inside of the property. Also that's letting me know that the seller does not even know what's going on in her property. So we really have to verify everything else that she's saying in the lease because it can be wrong and she may not know about it. So that was strike one. Next is the lease is dated for July 31, 2020. We were expecting it to start in August. Her answer is that the tenant get, uh, gets the lease agreement one month prior to, um, to the date starting. And that is why you see that the date is signed in July. Okay. Next is going to be <clears throat> the tenant appears to have been on a bi-weekly payment plan, 400 for the first two weeks and then 350, but the receipts show just one monthly payment. Her answer was the tenant is on a bi-weekly payment plan of 350 and 400 totaling 750 for the month. Um, I do only one receipt of the payment. 
So that's something that should have been disclosed because not all new buyers will want to receive by um, by um, weekly payments. <coughs> If you already have a relationship with the tenant and you know that they're going through a tough time right now, especially with COVID um, going on, then yeah, you may work out some type of payment arrangement with your tenant. But oftentimes, if you're stepping into a situation as a new landlord and you already see it sort of rocky right there, they can't even make the full payment at the first of the month or or you know or, or the third of the month, they can't make that full payment. That's letting you know that there's some instability right there. Um, so you, you just have to be careful if you do decide to move forward and acquire that property. So that was step, um, that was strike two for us. Um, next is there appears to be a back payment agreement in place for the tenant, or at least there was at the time of the signing of this lease. Explain. This is something between her entity and the tenant. So, so basically she's saying that's a personal issue and she's not going to disclose anything. So that's an issue for us because, again, this is just showing that there's some instability there. That's letting us know that this tenant has not been paying on time, um, even outside of the six months worth of receipts that, that we saw. For one, the receipts show one payment when there are actually two payments. And next, this is showing that, hey, this, this tenant has not always been on time. So. This is strike three for us. We're gonna see if we have any more strikes, but you know, under any other circumstances, after strike three, you're out. So we're gonna see if she was out or else um, if there was anything else that, that sort of um, made us back away from this deal. So next, um, this is not, is the landlord responsible for the water, for the water bill, $45, uh, $45 monthly? Can you confirm? So this is not the water bill, um, this is, MSD, which is our sewer bill here in St. Louis, and it is paid by the, by the landlord each month. Okay, that's fine. MSD is a lienable utility, so no matter whatever arrangement you work out between yourself and the tenant, you just have to make sure that that bill is being paid. Oftentimes for MSD, if it is handed over to the tenant, I'll set it up to where they can receive a duplicate bill to where it will have the account number and everything to where they can either go online, make a phone call, or go up to the grocery store or the check cash place and make the payment. However, I'll still receive the actual copy and I can keep tabs. I'm also keeping tabs online to make sure that the bill is still being paid every month because that's a municipal bill and they can put a lien on your property if it's not paid. So just keep that in mind. Next is going to be, um Trash paid, trash paid by the landlord, $12 monthly confirm. Yep, this is paid by the landlord every three months. That's fine. Next is going to be the tenant occupied the property since January 20th, 2018, a break in occupancy. What, um, what, what date to what date? So, so we want to know the time frame. And she just lets us know that the tenant actually started in November 1st, 2017 through July 31st, 2018. So we can see right there, we didn't go an entire year. Um, and then the, then the new lease starts August, 2018 and goes to August, 2021. Also, um, so she was just giving us the terms of the time frame that the, um, that the tenant was in the house. Also, do you have a rental application for the tenant? Yes, I will be faxing that over to you. So this was not presented to us at first. We, you know, we were looking at a property and didn't even really have an application on the tenant. When we asked the wholesaler, he, he didn't know, he didn't collect one from, from the seller. So we had to do more digging to see if there was some type of application in place so we can have a profile on this tenant and, and, and know the background of this person who we may be entering into a business relationship with. All right, lastly, um, I will email the items that the tenant would need to fill out and sign also. So we had also sent an application as well. Um, we also sent a form stating that no deposits of any sort were collected. This way, if we did take on this property and at the end of our lease or at the end of the current lease that's in place, the tenant can't come back and say, oh yeah, um, so I just need that deposit that I submitted and the seller's already long gone. It's six months past when she sold the property. We're calling, we can't get her. So we needed to have something in writing saying that no, that no deposit was ever collected for this property. So this is a sum of about uh, three to four to five strikes to where we just had to um, pull back 
my client, he's very conservative, just like myself, I'm very conservative. So if we start to see a bunch of red flags, especially with what's going on right now with COVID, um, we, we just have to pull back because there's going to be better deals out there with a, um, with a stronger tenant. So again, some things that you'll want to collect if you are looking to buy, buy and hold properties that are already tenant occupied is you're going to need that lease. You are going to need the tenant application. You are going to need the rent rolls. Try to get the last 12 months if you can. A lot of these uh, landlords, they, they don't have it. Try to get six months. If not, just try to get the receipts and bank statements. And then lastly is, um, it slipped my mind, lease application, rent rolls, deposit. If there's, a if there's a deposit in place, we need to know because that's going to transfer over to you at closing. And that's going to wrap it up, guys. Thank you so much for stopping by my channel. Again, I'm John. If you did enjoy the video, um, please go ahead and subscribe. I'm trying to get up to 500 subscribers. So everyone, you know, it all counts. It, it matters. I'm sitting there. I'm counting. I'm hoping that I'm helping someone out there. Um, again, if you are um, an experienced landlord as well, let me know what are some of the things or how you've shifted your buying criteria now during our um, during these times of COVID. So I'll see you guys next week. Thanks a lot for stopping.